Matthew 28. I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn back to that chapter this morning, if you would. This last week I was looking at pictures uh, online. I was looking for a picture of the empty tomb. And there's a variety of, of uh, pictures, different locations that people have uh, speculated as to where the burial was. Uh, there's one particular one that's probably it's kind of, uh, the garden tomb. It's probably the one where he was buried at. There's a church there called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I think. It's a big, massive, beautiful structure that claims to house both uh, the tomb and Calvary, which is quite doubtful. Uh, but a little ways away from that, there's a, a place outside the city walls of Jerusalem, Old Jerusalem, where Christ was likely buried. But I was looking for pictures of that place. I saw one that looked uh, especially interesting, so I clicked on, you know, if you click on a picture, it gets bigger. On the right-hand side, an advertisement popped up. The words that advertisement said this, buy, B-U-Y, buy the empty tomb of Jesus. I said, wow. <laughs> so Amazon.com. And they say you can buy anything on Amazon, so I thought, man, this is, that can't be. So I clicked on that ad, and uh, all it had was books and crafts and things like that of the empty tomb, not the tomb itself, but books about the tomb, crafts that you can put a little display on the table for, about the empty tomb. I thought that was kind of weird. By the empty tomb of Jesus. The tomb of Jesus is thankfully not for sale. It is a real place. Uh, some of you have been there to that tomb. Others would love to go and visit that tomb. Uh, it's available as no charge. Just go there and see it and even walk up right to it. But it's important to notice what took place there at that empty tomb, or at that tomb that eventually was empty. Chapter 28, verse number 1 of Matthew, tells us the when, the who, and the why of that tomb on this particular day. Verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, we call this a sunrise service, and of course we started somewhat after sunrise, and, uh, but the ladies there on that first day got there before sunrise, as it began to dawn. I had one of the other Gospels say it was still dark. They were up early. They took the Sabbath day off because of the, the law. Um, but the Sabbaths are over in terms of a, a restriction on a day of soul worship and not doing things. The Sabbaths were over, began to dawn toward the first day of the week. That's the when. The who, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but there's another Mary that was at the cross of Calvary. We mentioned that Friday night. She's named in this chapter as well, up in verse 56 of chapter 27, excuse me. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. That is the other Mary. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but that Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. That's the who. Here's the why, to see the sepulcher. If you're here Friday night, um, in Mark chapter 15, looking at the women that were standing afar off, the Bible says that they were beholding the cross, beholding Jesus' crucifixion. And we mentioned that the word behold does not mean just looking at it, but they were thinking about what they were seeing, contemplating and considering it. That's the word again here in verse number 1 of chapter 28, to see the sepulcher, to go back to that place where as far as they knew Jesus was still dead and buried away, and to consider that. To contemplate life without Jesus. That's what they went to the tomb to, to do. So they woke up early, as early as they really could, according to the law, Two of those that had seen him died came back to where they had seen him get buried at because they wanted to once again think about you know, what's happened here. This is not what we expected at all. For Jesus to die and that would be the end of it. But verse number 8, still in chapter 28, they departed quickly from the sepulcher, departed quickly from the tomb with fear and joy. They didn't stay there long. They were there for a little while, 
And then they quickly left the tomb. In fact, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 8, it says that they fled from there. They departed quickly and fled from the tomb. Why did they do that? Why did they not stay at the tomb? They woke up early. They went there to that place. Why did they not stay there? Why did they not linger? Why did they not you know, spend some time at that place where Jesus was buried at? This morning we're going to look, title of the message, Time to Leave the Grave. It was true for Mary Magdalene and the other Mary on that uh, resurrection morning. There are lessons for us as well to consider. Time to leave the grave. They departed quickly from the place where Jesus was buried. Matthew gives to us three different reasons why they left, why it was proper for them to leave the grave. The first reason, number one in our outline, our outline's putting on that uh, handout from this morning. Reason number one, because Jesus is not there. Jesus is not there. Time to leave the grave. The first reason for those two Marys to not stay there is because the person they came to see and to honor is not there anymore. They came to the tomb to put spices on a corpse. That's what their purpose was, to embalm the body of Jesus. They did not come here to worship the risen Savior. As far as they knew, he was still dead. Matthew doesn't mention the spices, but the other gospel writers knew that they came Uh, came there with spices to preserve the body, take care of that dead corpse body that they expected to find there. They were not there to worship. They were not there to see a resurrection. But when they arrived, things were not what they expected them to be. Perhaps they felt an earthquake. We'll talk about that in a couple moments. Whether they felt an earthquake or not, they saw an angel. Verses 2 and 3. In fact, they saw the angel of the Lord, we are told. It's not what they expected. They were wondering, who's going to move the stone? How are we going to get to see this body and to take care of that body? When they got there, they saw an angel sitting upon the stone of the door and sitting there where the body of Christ had laid. There were others there, of course. Verse number four, the keepers, the guards, those who were called by, desired by the chief priest to stand there to protect the graveside so nobody could get it and steal it. We're going to look at that a little bit later. We, in fact, read the passage, Matthew 28, a couple moments ago about them telling lies. They were afraid. They saw this angel, and they did shake, it says in verse number 4. And when the angel speaks, I love how he ignores the, the keepers. He didn't speak to them. He didn't say, don't worry about it. You have nothing to be afraid of. He left them alone. In your fear, just stay there. The person you crucified, the person you wanted dead, the person that you're here to make sure he stays in that tomb, uh, he's not there. You better be afraid of that person. But to the women, to those who believed in him, in Jesus, verse number five, fear not ye, you women, don't you be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. And then he gives to those women an invitation. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And again, not just come and look, but come and look and understand. He is not here. He is risen. Don't need to stay at the tomb. The one you're looking for is gone. He's no longer here. It's time to leave the grave. Millions of Muslims will travel every year to a place called Medina in South uh, Saudi Arabia. Why would they do that? Because the one that they honor as their main prophet, Muhammad, is buried there. They come to see the burial place of Muhammad. Millions of Americans travel to famous locations all over the country. 
We go to Arlington Cemetery and uh, see the eternal flame of John President Kennedy, or see the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Now uh, we go to Philadelphia and see uh, Ben Franklin's tomb. We go to presidential libraries and see where those presidents were buried at. Our son Tim just recently moved to Oxnard, California. Very close to that, he said, is the uh, presidential library of Ronald Reagan, where he and it, uh, his wife Nancy are buried at. And people go to those places and they honor those individuals who were famous and important, who are dead and buried in those places. Most of us go to cemeteries to remember our loved ones who are buried there on Memorial Day or other days, holidays, birthdays, etc. We go and honor our family members and our loved ones who have, been, who have died and been buried in those places. Nothing wrong with doing that. But the tomb of Jesus is empty. He's not there. He is risen as he said. So Jesus is not there. Where is he? Where is Jesus? If he's not there, if we don't travel to Jerusalem and see him buried in a tomb, where is he? He is in different places. For you and I, we're in one place at a time. It's unique with Jesus. You ask him where he is, there's more than one answer to that question. First of all, he is in heaven. The Bible tells us that he ascended back into heaven. Colossians 3, verse 1, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So he's there. The Bible also tells us that he is in you. If you trust in Christ your Savior, he is in you. Colossians 3, verse 1, uh, Christ in you is the hope of glory. The assurance that we have of being in heaven is because Christ is in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then the last verse that we read, Matthew 28, 20, He is always with you to the end of the world. And that word world is not speaking of location. Wherever you are, He is with you. I am with you no matter where you are. But the end of the world speaks of a period of time, not a location. As long as there is time on earth, Jesus Christ will be with those who believe in Him. So He's not in the tomb. Praise the Lord for that, and praise the Lord as well for where He is. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is living within believers who trust in Him, and wherever we go, He is with us. So to these women who came to see a, a corpse, take care of a dead body, no need to stay there. He is not there. And when they understood that, they departed quickly. A second reason not to stay at a tomb, time to leave the grave, number two, is because our loved ones will not remain there. Our loved ones will not remain there. As ladies came to that tomb, verse number two, says that there was an earthquake. There had been an earthquake. Not sure the exact timing of this earthquake, did it happen as the ladies were approaching? Did they feel it on their steps traveling towards that tomb? Uh, did it take place the moment Jesus rose from the dead? Did it happen when the angel rolled the stone away? Did it happen earlier than that? We're not told the timing of it. Just that it happened, it had happened as they came to that grave. But the Bible tells us of another earthquake a couple of days before. If you're in Matthew 28, look at the previous chapter chapter 27, and down to verse number 50, Matthew 27, 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves, and notice these next three words, after his resurrection, not the day he died, which is evidently when the earthquake took place and when the graves opened, but after his resurrection is when they arose and came out of those graves. And they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. There was an earthquake the day Jesus died. 
Maybe that's the earthquake mentioned in verse 2 of chapter 28. Maybe it's a different earthquake that took place on resurrection morning. No way to really know that. But after his resurrection, others arose from the dead and came out of their graves. And we're not told what happened to these. It's kind of interesting, I guess, to speculate. What happened to these ones who had died, were buried, buried there in Jerusalem? And then after the resurrection of Christ, the same day of his resurrection, quite likely, they arose again, arose from the dead, went into Jerusalem. What happened to them after that? Did they die again? Parent, their family had to take them back to place and bury them again? Did they return to the place where they were buried at previously and lay back to sleep again, die again? Did Jesus take them to heaven with him? The Bible never tells us what happened. That's one of those questions. We get to heaven and ask the Lord, what happened to those saints that rose on the day of your resurrection? The Bible tells us that Jesus is the first fruits of them that sleep. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. They did not precede him in rising from the dead. After his resurrection, they rose from the dead. But the time is coming, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, when all that are in the grave will hear his voice and will come forth. Every dead person, saved and lost, will someday be raised again from the dead. And those who know Christ as Savior will be raised unto life. Those in the grave will not remain there. Just as Jesus rose again, so will all who die in Jesus be raised again from the dead be taken to be with him. We visit the graves of our loved ones. We keep the ashes of our loved ones. We mourn their death, but they will not remain in the grave. The question could be asked to them as well, where are they? In a real sense, they're not in the grave at all. Their bodies are, but their spirits, their souls are with the Lord in heaven. There's a little three-year-old girl whose great-grandmother passed away. And to try to explain what had happened, they told this three-year-old, your great-grandmother, she has gone to heaven to be with Jesus. The day of the funeral came, and the family, including this little girl, came to the, uh, to the church where... They were to conduct the service. And the little girl walked in and saw her grandmother in a pretty pink casket at the front of the, of the sanctuary. And she asked her parents, is this heaven? Is Jesus here? Our bodies will be placed in a grave. But our souls will immediately go to heaven. We will be with Jesus immediately when we die. So we visit graves, honor our loved ones. But we need to remember, they aren't there. That is not heaven. That's not where they're at right now. They are with the Lord. And then because Jesus rose, we know that those who have died will also rise again from the dead. Just a couple of weeks ago, March 27th, our nation was shocked once again by a mass murder, this time in a, a Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee. A girl who is herself sick walked into this school, shot up the door so she could get into it, and then carried out her wrath against innocent people. Three nine-year-old children and then three adult teachers and people within the school. One of those children that was killed is a little nine-year-old girl named Hallie Scruggs. Her dad is a pastor of the church that operated the school and kind of the administrator of the school. His name is Chad Scruggs. And a few days after his nine-year-old daughter died, he said these words, wrote these words. Through tears, we trust that she is in the arms of Jesus, who will raise her to life again. And that simple statement by a grieving father 
captures exactly what happens when a child of God dies. Safe in the arms of Jesus, who will in the future be raised to life once again. Those who are in the grave will not remain there. In fact, there's a real sense they're not even there right now. Their bodies are, but their souls are safe in the arms of Jesus, and then those bodies will be raised again to be with the Lord. Keep a mark, if you would, in Matthew 28, and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you would. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The last several verses of this chapter describe that same thing. There was 2,000 years ago, at least in Thessalonica, believers in Christ who were concerned about what happened to their loved ones. They had been taught it before, but they had doubts or questions about it. So Paul says this, starting in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Ignorance, that's not an insult. He's not calling them ignorant. He's just saying, I don't want you to be unknowing of what the truth is. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Bring with him indicates they're with him right now. They're going to come down again with him. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, not just some hope that we have and with no basis, but by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, because these things are true, comfort one another with these words. And there is great comfort in those words. Our loved ones are currently with Jesus, and when the Lord comes again, he will bring them with him. Their bodies will be raised. The dead in Christ shall rise. And those alive at that time will be caught to, together to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. So we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Our hope is certain. Our loved ones are with Jesus now. We will be with Jesus when we die. And we will be gathered together, resurrected to meet the Lord in the air. Just their bodies are in the grave. So there's no reason to remain there. Our loved ones won't. Time to leave the grave because Jesus is not there. Time to leave the grave because our loved ones do not remain there. Thirdly, time to leave the grave because others need to hear from us. Others need to hear from us. Those who know Christ as Savior, need to tell others about Christ, the risen Savior. Final reason to leave the grave. People need to hear what we know and what we believe, that Jesus is alive. We sang about that just a couple moments ago. Uh, th third verse, that song, In the Garden. I would stay in the garden with him. I'd love to stay here, stay at the grave. I'd love to stay here. But he bids me go to a world of woe. He tells me, you need to go and tell others about Jesus. And there's two types of people, two groups of people that we need to tell. The emphasis in verses 7 and 10 is tell other believers in Christ. Verse 7, tell his disciples, the angel said, go quickly, tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. Verse 10, Jesus says, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. There are believers who need to be assured of the truth of the resurrection. They might doubt it. They might have just recently lost, lost a loved one, and so they're having concerns and questions. What's happened? What will happen to my loved one? Will I see them again? Go tell others. Jesus is alive, and those who believe in him will be raised as well. And they're with him when they 
leave this world. Believers need to be assured of the truth of the resurrection. But it's also a message that the world needs to hear. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Share the gospel with everyone. The good news, Christ died for our sins and rose again the third day. Share that message with the world. Because they need to believe in Jesus. Tell your unsaved friends, Jesus died for your sins and rose again from the dead. Tell your unsaved family members, Jesus loves you, died for your sins, he rose again from the dead. Tell those that you work with that don't believe in Jesus Christ, he died for you, he rose again from the dead. You can be saved through faith in him. Your neighbors, anyone you know, unsaved, lost, tell them the good news of the gospel. Christ died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. They need to hear that. The ladies at the tomb left it quickly. They departed quickly and fled, as Mark says. Because Jesus is not there, because our loved ones do not remain there, and because others need to hear from us. We are in God's house today, celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. And the Resurrection Day is probably the best day of the year for, for believers in Christ, the best day of the year. The actual day of the resurrection, this day described in Matthew 28, probably the best day in the history of the world, the day when Jesus, who had died, rose again from the dead. The best place to be on that day, the tomb, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. But those who are there, verse 8, departed quickly from the sepulcher. They left to share the word of God. Don't depart quickly from here. we got more to do. Breakfast, I made it, four minutes. At breakfast, we have worship, we have singing, we have a good rest of the morning. But throughout the week, Having left this place, tell others about Jesus Christ. Tell them he died for their sins and he has risen again. And comfort believers as well with that great promise and assurance. Jesus is alive. He as he said. Let's bow together in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful truth that we are celebrating this morning. That the tomb is empty. That Jesus is no longer there. He was there for those three days and three nights. But very early, that first day of the week, he had already risen from the dead. Thank you, Father, for the assurance that we have that he is not there. Father, I thank you as well that as believers in Jesus Christ, we know where we will be forever. We know where our loved ones who trust in Jesus are at currently have passed away. Thank you for the confidence and the hope and the assurance that we know that they are with you. Thank you that we know that we will be reunited again someday. Jesus Christ will return and take all those who believe in him to gather together, be with, meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. But Father, until that time comes, we have a mission to accomplish. We need to tell others. We need to comfort other believers with the truth of the resurrection. And we need to share that gospel message with the lost. Help us, Father, to not spend time contemplating the resurrection, but to quickly get about doing what you've called us to do, take the gospel to the world. I ask, Father, for your blessing as we sing this final hymn together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.